start saying it, it's all over here. <laughs> I'm really fitting in with this Midwest thing. Yeah, well, aren't I? yeah, there you go. As the crowds settle in, I might take a moment. <laughs> Very Presbyterian crowd indeed. Way in the back, meandering in. First song, half empty, into the first song. Most people are there. That's right. I don't need well, to see you come in. I can begin because uh, you can hear me, I am sure, I'm hoping. It is good to gather with you all today, in and or beside the house of our Lord, where two or three are gathered. There our Lord is also, and so we will worship together. With the elders and the deacons, with all of the pastoral staff and ministry staff and everybody who is helping make this, uh, these services of worship possible, welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian Church. As we are preparing our hearts for worship, we wanted to lift up some, or lift up at least one thing for you to keep in prayer this week, uh, Charlie Hargrove and passed away last weekend and his services or the services were this past week and so if you could keep Marilyn and Travis and Jordan and the rest of Charlie's family and friends in your prayers uh, they would appreciate that as would we. We invite you to share your prayers and concerns with us as well you can email us or text us if you have our numbers there I believe there are forms on the back table if you wish to do so as well. And the staff and um, and members of this church will keep you in our prayers, to be sure. The life of this congregation is never stagnant nor boring. And um, as we wake up this sleeping giant that is First Presbyterian Church, we continue to identify the leaders and volunteers who serve in leadership roles for our church. Today at noon, uh, we will have a Zoom meeting, a congregational meeting, to elect the elders and deacons for, uh, for this year coming up. You should have received a link to that in the, your email this week. If you have not received that, please email Marvin or myself so that we can get you into that meeting. Um, but we hope and pray that you will join us that, at noon for that today. Let us begin our worship service. Friends, thanks for being here this morning. We do invite you to stand as you are able. And we would like to begin today as a continue, with a song that is a continuation of our uh, belief and our reminder that uh, while we celebrated Easter Sunday last week, that our Easter season and our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus uh, continues all year long. So join us now as we sing together, Christ is Risen. The words will be on your digital bulletin or on your printed bulletin this morning.
You may be seated. Indeed, Christ is risen from the dead, but death came because of our brokenness, because of the sinful things humanity did, does, and will do. Trusting in God's mercy, but dwelling in, if just for a moment, the ways that we have fallen short of God's glory. Let us come to God in a time of prayer. Please pray with me the prayer that is in your bulletin. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we have remained captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you've made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Friends, God hears our prayers and God knows our hearts. We are a sinful people calling out to a perfect and powerful God, but we know how this story ends. Because of God's work through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can be sure of our forgiveness because he lives, we might live. He is risen, hallelujah, amen. Having received forgiveness, our hearts can be at peace. We are filled with peace overflowing, and so let us take a moment to share that peace with one another using socially distant uh, signs and symbols, words of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. show up in rocks are very special just like God if we let him into our lives and help us help him get into the layers of our life and let him clean us off 
We're full of sparkles, just like this rock, and layers. So don't think of rocks as just being common and boring because they have lots of layers and lots of sparkles, just like God wants us to have. So next time you see a rock, take a close look and see if it's special, just like you. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for making us strong like the rocks from the earth. Help us remember that we all have sparkles and layers if we just allow God inside and others to look closely. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up, and you guys have a great week. As we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, I invite you to pray with me. Let us pray. Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit, so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. When I was a kid, in the summertime we would go to the beach a lot. And along the way to the beach, there was a wide place in the road called Mako, and we would cross some railroad tracks there. And when we would cross the railroad tracks, my dad would slow down and he would tell us kids to look carefully up one direction and down the other way on the railroad tracks, not to look for trains, but to look for the ghost of Joe Baldwin. Do you know about the ghost of Joe Baldwin? You, oh, we have one, one native North Carolinian here who knows about the ghost of Joe Baldwin. So this is what happened to poor old Joe Baldwin. He was a brakeman on a train that passed through Mako at some point a little bit after the Civil War. And Joe Baldwin noticed that his caboose had come unhooked from the rest of the train that was pulling him toward Wilmington. And what was worse, there was another train behind him on the tracks who was gaining on him. And so Joe grabbed a lantern and frantically waved the lantern at the oncoming train so that it would slow down, but to no avail. The uh, train overtook Joe Baldwin. There was a terrible crash, and poor old Joe lost his head. He was decapitated. And then a few years later, people started seeing strange lights going up and down the railroad tracks. And what it was, they said, it was Joe Baldwin with that lantern looking for his severed head somewhere along the railroad tracks. Ooh. I just, so I know it's, uh, it's April, but you know, Halloween's right around the corner. Um, and I love this ghost story. We never saw uh, the ghost of Joe Baldwin. I think they were starting to take the tracks up, and the light has disappeared since then. I guess Joe didn't want to like, look for the, his severed head amongst the, uh, I don't know, the briars and second growth pines that take over a, a railroad track. But anyway, I love this story because it's sort of uh, typical of ghost stories in general. Ghost stories in general, they're concerned about unfinished business. You know, if you, if you leave this world with loose strings, not tied up, then somehow you can kind of get caught up between this world and the next. And so the loose strings that Joe Baldwin failed to tie up was, well, he, he lost his head. And he couldn't move on to the next world. He couldn't rest in peace until he had found his missing head and had somehow gotten himself back together again. That's what ghost stories are about. Uh, and, and other times, other ghost stories, they're often about some sort of crime or some sort of awful secret. And you think you can take these secrets with you to the grave, but you can't really. So the, the ghost is there where uh, maybe the ghost is the perpetrator of a crime or the victim of a crime or a, uh, an eyewitness to a crime or some terrible secret. And the ghost will not rest until the secret comes out and justice is done. And then there can be rest, eternal rest, for the, the dearly departed. So let me ask you a question. Um, 
as you look toward your eternal rest, how's it going to go for you? Uh, are, there, are there terrible secrets that you hope to take to the grave with you? Uh, or maybe there is going to be some experience of trauma that's going to interrupt your eternal rest, maybe? Uh, I think we all look to the grave, we all look to our own deaths with various kinds of uh, anxieties. But our anxieties are about death are really addressed in a hopeful and wonderful way in this Easter season. We are about uh, 10 days out from Good Friday, the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins, and a week out from Easter, the good news of his resurrection. And the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, the writers of Scripture come back to over and over again. That is basically the core of our faith. And they can address and speak to our anxieties about what happens to us afterward and to also um, the unpleasant things that happen and may happen to us in this world. And so I want to now share with you a passage of Scripture about that uh, and about our hope in Christ's cross and resurrection. It's 1 John, uh, Audra's already alluded to it, uh, chapter 1, and we're going to go on into chapter 2, verse 2. And in these first few verses, John gives us the assurance that we have rest to look forward to after we die. And more than that, we have to look forward to being raised in glory. So let's start with that, and then we'll talk a little bit about the rest of the chapter. Listen now for God's word to us from 1 John 1 verses 1 through 4. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John says that God's eternal word, God's word of life, Jesus Christ, is something that he saw and heard and touched. And I'm really struck by that word touched. In other translations of the scripture, it's rendered handled. That Jesus Christ is God's word of life that John and the other disciples handled. Uh, and it calls to mind some of the amazing events around the resurrection. According to the Gospel of Matthew, when the women saw the resurrected Jesus, they fell at his feet and worshipped him, and they grabbed hold of his feet. They, they handled his feet. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus appears to the disciples. He has a little bit of broiled fish to eat. And then he invites them to touch him and see that he's been raised from the dead. And then in John's Gospel, you get the biggest example of this. John, uh, in, According to John, Jesus practically invites the Apostle Thomas to be his wound care nurse, uh, to take his fingers and place them in the holes in his hands and in his feet and in his side. And I think that what Jesus is doing here is he's trying to reassure some frightened disciples that he's not just a ghost. He's not a disembodied spirit. He's, he's not like Joe Baldwin or uh, any of these other ghost stories that we hear. He has been raised from the dead. It's the same Jesus, and the, the body that was put to death on the cross is now before them. But at the same time, it's not a body like the bodies that you and I currently inhabit. Uh, the Gospels say that in some places uh, Jesus is able to pass through locked doors, even though he has a body. Uh, and in other places it says that uh, the disciples often don't recognize Jesus when they first see him. He has to call them by name before they understand that it's him. So it's a body like ours, and it's a body that's not like ours at the same time. The, the biggest difference, of course, is that it's a body that can never again experience corruption or death. And Paul says, uh, the Apostle Paul, writing in another place in the New Testament, he says that it's kind of like the difference between a seed and a fully grown plant. That our bodies right now are just uh, seeds, but through a creative act of God, what we call the resurrection, they will develop and be glorified in a way that we can't imagine right now. And in a way that uh, the cosmos itself can't generate. So... Uh, Joe Baldwin, he can rest his 
well, he can't rest his weary head, uh, but he can trust that he can go, he can rest because he's going to get his head back better than new. And it's going to be attached to his torso and nothing like that can happen again. I'm being facetious, uh, but, I'm, <laughs> but, I'm, but you know, I'm also being serious because in this world, we suffer in our bodies. You know, many people die violent deaths or traumatic deaths. Uh, many people die prematurely. Uh, some people are put to death in terrible ways and, and put, together, put to death for uh, unjust and immoral reasons. Uh, and even the rest of us, you know, we, we talk a lot about wanting to have a good death. And we've made a lot of progress in the last uh, decades with hospice care and with palliative care. Uh, but the truth is, you know, most of us are probably going to experience some sort of physical pain or discomfort as we draw close to dying. But the good news is that our bodies in which we suffer so much will be raised and glorified. And it's fitting that God raises us from the dead and gives us a new body because our bodies are part of us. And our bodies are that part of us that we experience pain and suffering in. And so I think that the, the resurrection of the body, which we confess every Sunday when we say uh, the Apostles' Creed, and we'll, we'll recite that in a few moments, I think it really makes all the difference for us. And I think that it also is a kind of word of challenge, I think both to Christians and to those who are not yet on the path of discipleship. It's, it's a challenge to us Christians because if all we have to look forward to is going to heaven when we die, then what are we doing feeding hungry bodies? What are we doing housing homeless bodies? What are, what are we doing tending to sick bodies? But if we have something more to look forward to, not just that when we die we're with God, but that on the last day our bodies are going to be raised and glorified, then we can be assured that our little acts of love and kindness now matter not just today, but they matter forever. So, you know, when you uh, tend a boo-boo on your child or your grandchild's knee, when you are a researcher developing a vaccine or you're a nurse injecting that vaccine into someone's arm, uh, when you are at Lowe's and Fishes offering food to someone who is hungry, you are caring for bodies that are fearfully and wonderfully made by our Creator and will, on the last day, be restored and remade into something glorious. There's also, I think, a, a word of challenge in the resurrection of the body to people who are not yet on the path of discipleship. I think you, you don't have to be a Christian to care about people's well-being, to feed the sick or take care of the, feed the hungry, to care for the sick, or to take care of people who are suffering. But in the long run, if there is no resurrection of the body, then these acts of kindness merely delay the inevitable. But the resurrection of the body gives us hope that there's more to it than just delaying the inevitable. That when God raises the dead, God will vindicate us in our bodies and vindicate those little acts of kindness that we've been doing throughout our lives. So that's what Jesus says, or that's what John says that Jesus is doing for those of us who have suffered in the flesh. He also has some more words to say, and these words apply not so much to what God has done by raising Christ from the dead as to what God has done for us in the cross. And I want to share the last part of the passage of Scripture with you now, picking up with verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while walking in the darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all our sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, 
but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, when we look to the great beyond, we may think that we can go there with a clear conscience. You know, I haven't killed anybody, haven't had an affair, haven't uh, knocked over a 7-Eleven and cleared out the 